stars begin to fall. My Lord, the morning, my Lord, the morning, oh my Lord, what a morning, when the stars begin to fall. You will Hello, my name is Pam Rowe, and I have been a member of United Lutheran Church for almost 18 years. My husband Greg and I and our three kids uh, have attended uh, our whole time in Red Wing. And so today I've been asked to share with you a little bit about how God has helped me through a storm. And in my case, my big storm is a breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, just about four years ago. And so there are a lot of storms out there and getting a cancer diagnosis is a pretty big one. I have so many, so many stories that I could share with you about how God has helped me through that storm. I'm very blessed. Uh, but I'm going to quickly share with you three different stories. Um, and they're about angels because God works through people, and I truly believe that. Uh, I went through about 16 rounds of chemo, and the last four uh, were I was given a, a drug called the Red Devil. And the Red Devil uh, has very appropriately been named because, well, for one, it's red, and that's very intimidating. Uh, but for two, it's a pretty potent drug, and I was very anxious to be getting the Red Devil. And so as they were starting the Red Devil and I was having a lot of anxiety, uh, Greg and I were praying about it. We were having a devotion. And just as it was about to start, this woman came into my infusion room and started chatting with Greg and I. And uh, I, I recognized her voice um, and I, I just couldn't place where she was from. And as we talked more and talked more, I realized that uh, she and I worked together uh, as at an elementary school in Rochester when I worked there. And so uh, it was just a delight to have a conversation with her and reconnect with her. And uh, right before she left, I realized that the whole red devil had just gone into my system. Uh, and I, I just feel strongly that God put this wonderful angel into my life that day when I was particularly feeling a lot of anxiety. So that's my first angel story. The second angel story that I wanted to share with you is the very last day of my chemotherapy treatments. Uh, Greg and I and the three kids went out for dinner to celebrate the end of my treatments of chemotherapy. And I was feeling pretty happy about that, but I was also looking at one of my worst days. My hair was gone, my eyelashes were gone, my eyebrows were gone, um, my eyes were constantly watering. Um, I was in pretty rough shape, but we went out to celebrate nonetheless. And after we were done eating, we went to pay our bill and it had been paid by somebody in the restaurant. Even to this day, that makes me feel um, overwhelmed um, because I somebody in that restaurant saw us, maybe overheard us, knew that we were struggling as a family and finding whatever joy we could find. 
And in that moment, that angel came forward uh, and shared a great gift. And I think about that a lot. And then the third angel story I wanted to share with you is the day of my double mastectomy. And as you can imagine, that was a day filled with a lot of anxiety too. And as I was on the operating table and prepare my all of the um, the doctors and the the nurses were preparing for the surgery. Um, the nurse uh, anesthetist came over and she said, "Pam, would it be okay?" if we prayed for you before we started. I didn't ask for that prayer, um, but she sensed as a fellow Christian that, and, and maybe a, an angel sent by God, uh, that that's exactly what I needed. And so she announced to the whole operating room to stop what they were doing, if, if they were willing, and to come and, and say a prayer with me. And so everybody in the whole operating room stopped what they were doing they came over to me and they all laid hands on me. And the nurse anesthetist said a prayer. And uh, shortly after that, I was given anesthesia and woke up several hours later. Um, but to go into that situation with such peace, because the people around me were filled with the Holy Spirit, I knew I was in great hands. And so I just wanted to share this story um, of of my journey, a little bit of my journey, because storms are not meant to be gone through alone. And you will find angels among you as you journey through a, a cancer diagnosis or any storm that you may be experiencing. It's been my pleasure to share my a little bit of my story with you today. God's blessings to you all. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, the disciples took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Is Jesus still sleeping? Yep. Huh. Looks a little bit like rain. Yep. <laughs> oh man, I, now it's starting to rain. Yep. Jesus still sleeping? Yep. Man, I can't believe that guy. He can sleep through anything. starting to pour. Yep. Do, do you think we can wake Jesus up pretty soon? Yep. Oh man. I'm, I'm starting to kind of get scared. Yep. Are you? Yep. <laughs> it's getting bad. Yep. This is awful. Yep. I don't know. I, I, where's Jesus? woke Jesus up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Yep. The first thing you have to understand about the storm in the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel is that this just isn't an eensy weensy tiny little storm. No, no, this isn't a storm that's going to be good for the garden. This isn't a storm where, you know what, maybe I'll have to pick up a few branches in the morning before I mow sort of storm. This, this is a grab the dog and run for shelter sort of storm. This is 
bury yourself in the basement and tremble every time it thunders sort of storm. The Bible, at least my version of the Bible, calls it a great storm, but even that, that doesn't do it justice. You see, the, the word Mark uses to describe this storm, it's megas. It's where we get the word mega from. You know the difference between a phone and a megaphone? That's the difference between a storm and a mega storm. Andrew, Peter, James, and John, they are stuck in a mega storm. Now, now, oftentimes we mock the disciples for their reactions. And to be sure, we will do that another day in another story, but, but not in this story. You see, the disciples have every reason to respond. To this. You, see, you see, the disciples are stuck in the water. They have been out on the Sea of Galilee more times than they can count ever since they were children. These disciples have endured more storms than we could possibly imagine, and yet there is something very different about this storm. This storm is beyond anything they have ever experienced. This is the storm they don't come back from. They know that this is a storm that, that any moment could end their life. This is one of those storms that people still talk about 10 or 15 years later. This is a storm that destroys everything in its path, including them. People of God, the reality is we have a lot of people right now who feel like they're stuck in a mega storm. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the everyday rains we all experience. We know it. Proverbially speaking, it rains in life. It, when your car doesn't start in the morning and you're a half an hour late for work, or, or somebody in the household comes down with a bad cold and it inconveniences everyone, or your new teenage driver in your house goes to school and gets in a fender bender and it costs somebody a couple hundred dollars. No, that, that's, that's rain. I'm talking about storms. I'm talking about the woman from our community who, who would tell her story and with every fiber of her being point back to her mother to say, this is the person who raised me, who shaped me, who has taught me more things than I can count. She is, the reason I am who I am is because of her. And yet, because of circumstances beyond her control, now that her mom is in failing health and she wants to go and do nothing more than speak words of encouragement and put her arms around her beloved mother because of circumstances, again, beyond her control, she can't do that. She can hold her hand, she can speak words of encouragement, but it, it's not the same. And this woman feels like she's stuck in a storm. Think about the gentleman who, who sent his oldest to college just a couple weeks ago. And he's, he's delighted for, for how his child is doing and he's so proud and yet he went home that night and, and still when his head hit the pillow was worried about what could happen in the next few months. Not just for his child but also for his own job situation and how he wondered how am I going to be able to provide for my family. He feels like he's stuck in a storm and we could go on. Right? Many of us feel like whether it was COVID induced or something else that the clouds have, have gathered in and they just, they have not dissipated once in these last five or six months. We feel like we're stuck in a storm. And for other people, it's, it's the waking up to the reality of injustice in the world. It feels like it's just overwhelming. And for other people, it's, it's not knowing how to talk about that injustice or to address it in a way that doesn't feel like it's, it's tearing down the very fabric of our communities. And for others, it's, it's something else. It's, it's, it's our political reality. It's, it's people bickering back and forth and not having solutions. And for others, it's, it's, it's feeling heart, heart loss or heartache because, because we know that when we want to talk about some of these issues that that if we find the wrong family member or the wrong friend and we do so, that conversation goes off the tracks ever so, ever so quickly. It's all of these things at once feel like they would be a storm, but when they come one after another after another, it very quickly turns into a megastorm. We know what the disciples are feeling because we're, 
we feel like we're stuck in that same storm, which is why we sympathize with how the disciples respond. They, the first thing they do is they panic. It, it makes perfect sense. Peter, James, Andrew, John, they've been in storms before, but this, this is different. No matter how much water they bail, no matter how many times they, they put the buckets in, no matter how many times they try to turn their boat around, it, it just doesn't work. It, there's, just, there's just nothing they can do, and so they, they panic. You know what happens when we panic? Our, our minds start racing a little bit faster. We start jumping from one thing to another. We don't think as clearly as we used to. Next thing we know when we are panicked, we say things we regret, or we say things more harshly than we intended, or we see something we don't fully understand and yet we jump to a conclusion and we overreact. That's what happens to people who are stuck in the midst of a storm. We panic. We panic and we blame. We blame lots of people right now, don't we? I mean, we could go down a list. We blame politicians for the problems we face. Depending on which particular party you affiliate with, we, we blame people from the other side, past or present. If you're on the right, you blame people on the left. If you're on the left, you blame people on the right. But we all can agree on this. There's always people to blame for our problems. And if we don't blame politicians, then we're quick, at least in our society right now, we'll, we'll blame people in positions of authority. We'll blame some police officers, all police officers, for the, for the sins of a few. And if we don't choose to do that, then how often do we hear people blaming victims of injustice, wondering, well, what did they, what did they really do to deserve what they got? We can always find someone to blame. We, we blame the media for telling a story incorrectly, or we blame neighbors for not believing what the media is telling us. We, we always have someone to blame. It goes round and around and around and around. And we start by blaming people who are far from us, but eventually as the circles draw closer, we're blaming even those who love us most dearly. That's what the disciples did. In the midst of that storm, they panicked and then they blamed. They even blamed Jesus. In their panic, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they begin shouting, Jesus, Jesus who's, who's, awake, who's asleep in the boat, wake up. Jesus, don't, don't you care? We're, we're about ready to perish here. We're going to drown. This storm is going to kill us. W wake up, Jesus, don't you care? You see the irony there? In the midst of their panic, with that temptation to blame, the disciples assume, the disciples assume that Jesus who was sleeping in the boat, he doesn't possibly care. There's no way in the world Jesus cares about them. And yet there is another possibility, right? You know it, I know it. What's the other possibility? It's not that Jesus doesn't care. It's that Jesus isn't afraid of this storm. And the next thing that happens in Mark's gospel is Jesus stands up, he looks at the waves and the wind, and Jesus rebukes the waves, and he rebukes the wind. And in Mark's gospel, my Bible tells you, a dead calm fell on the sea, but the word, friends, it's not dead. It's that same Greek word, megas. Do you understand what's happening in the story? A mega storm hits the disciples, Jesus stands up, he rebukes it, and he causes a mega calm to fall upon the, on, the, on the waters. Jesus brings a mega calm. People of God, in the midst of this story, as you reflect on it, I hope you will remember two things. First, notice where Jesus was at in the midst of this storm. For Peter, for James, for John, for Andrew, for all the rest of the disciples, the great irony is that Jesus was in the boat the entire time. Whatever it is that you're going through in this world, you can trust that Jesus is in the boat with you. You have a Lord and Savior who loves you so much that he chose to become flesh and dwell with you. Again, whatever it is that you're going through, Jesus has chosen to be with you in your boat. That's the first thing I hope you to remember. But the second thing is just as important. In church, we always talk about how God 
and person of Jesus Christ loves and forgives and shows mercy and humility and calls us to service to be sure all those things are true. But there's one aspect of Jesus we leave out over and over again, and that is this. Jesus is tougher than nails. People of God, Jesus doesn't just choose to dwell with you, to sit in your boat with you. Jesus is tougher than whatever storm you might face. When Jesus stands up and shows his power to still the, the sea, to, to calm the waters, Jesus shows his power and Jesus has that same power with whatever storm you are facing this day. And you know how the story ends? It's beautiful. As the disciples look out on that still water, on that mega calm sea, they are filled with great awe. Of course, you know by now that in Mark's gospel in the fourth chapter, it's, it's not great, is it? The word is the same word. In the midst of that mega storm, Jesus rebukes it, causing a mega calm upon the sea. And when the disciples are left looking at Jesus, they are filled with a mega awe that he is with them and the power that he has in their lives. People of God, may you know this day that Jesus is with you in your boat. May you remember every day that Jesus is more powerful than any storm you may face. And if you can remember that, may you be filled with mega awe of what God has done, is doing, and will do in your life through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi everyone. So here in Red Wing, we just finished our first week of school. So we want to take a moment now to pray for all of the students and teachers and other people who made school happen this year. So for those of you who are attending worship with one of those teachers or students or other staff members, I invite you to put a hand on their shoulders right now. For the rest of us, I invite you to stick your hand out towards your screen as we all take a moment to pray for those students and staff members and workers and just for our school communities all over the place. recognize this cross. It's down here in the basement at church. Uh, it has the names of many past and present members here at United Lutheran. It's down by the Sunday School Rooms. Um, I've walked past this cross quite a few times in the last few months that church has been closed, probably on the way to have a staff meeting uh, with planning the online services that you've been watching. But when I look at all of the names of these people, it makes me realize that 
even though you weren't here in church physically, have not been for a long time uh, to worship, that you are still keeping the church in your hearts and minds. And uh, we know that you have done that, and through one of the ways is the offerings that you continue to give. And it's a wonderful way to show that you are supporting the church, even if you cannot be here, uh, until that day comes that you are back. So very easy, three simple ways to do it. As always, you can text to give. You can send your money through the mail to the United Lutheran Church office, or you can go to the United Lutheran Church website and find the online giving tab. Thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you for the season of fall, for the colors of the leaves, for apples, pumpkins, and squash getting ripe, and for school starting again. Fall this year brings new anxiety for those living where the temperature falls and gathering outdoors will be more difficult. Calm our fears about this pandemic. Remind us of your love and peace. Help us to be creative in connecting and reaching out to one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God bless the poor. God bless the poor. God bless our family. God bless the teachers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all of our teachers, administrators, support staff, custodians, cooks, bus drivers, and counselors working hard to provide a learning experience for all students. Please keep everyone safe, healthy, and excited to learn and grow this year. Calm the fears and the anxiety for the parents and the kids, whether they're learning at home or in the building. Remind them of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, keep our family and friends safe. In this time of need, we are all looking for a new norm of life. Keeping a roof over our heads, keeping food on the table. It affects everyone. Our parents, our grandparents, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. It leaves no one out. So therefore, Lord, would you please look over our family and friends once again. Keep us all safe. Give us guidance in these days. Dear Lord, help us find a way to get rid of hate. Help our lives live a more positive life. Once again, Lord, please keep food on our tables, a roof over our heads. Keep us all safe. Thank you for listening. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.